Hi everyone, it's V and welcome back to another video on Critical Healing Moment. On this channel, I make videos related to topics that I'm often thinking about when it comes to my involvement in social justice work and healing work and grad school and life in general. So if you're interested in any of these topics, then I hope you subscribe to my channel. I just can't get this I don't dream of labor thing off of my mind. It's been something I've been obsessing about a little bit lately. And I think that it's safe to say with so many people trying to contribute to this conversation that millennials and Gen Z are just tired of working and the expectation that we have to work in order to survive. And this is not just contained into YouTube, but it's been a part of conversations that I've been a part of for the last year, even more. Well, I was excited to see these critiques of capitalism and work on the YouTube mainstream being blessed by the algorithm at first. I grew cautious of how easy it can be to romanticize anti-work ideology on social media and ignore the complexities of the fantasy of no longer having to work. Because I think there's a difference between unlearning a culture that rewards traditional career advancement while having the privilege and access to alternative streams of income and unlearning a culture that shames and belittles you for not making something out of your life and being at peace with knowing that you will have to labor or if you are in a body that is not valuable to capitalism and thus must be subjected to the social welfare system, just being at peace with knowing that you will have to endure this system while being committed to ending capitalism. This topic is close to my heart, something that I've been thinking about a lot obviously because i have been through a lot of work induced trauma that's what i'll call it in the last few years and that's why in preparing for this video i had to just make a completely different one to address the whole i do not dream of labor trend because this video was in the works for a while and then i saw this popping up and it was everywhere and I was like, should I change this whole video to address it? But I really wanted to keep this video on the topic of nonprofits. So while the trend of this I do not dream of labor video genre is popular now, the seeds for this video were planted a long, long time ago. I would say like almost four years ago at this point. And it took experiencing a handful of professional setbacks as you might call it in sort of the dominant worldview in order for me to have this perspective now. Since this video primarily draws upon my personal experience, I'll be talking about three types of jobs and that would be corporate white collar jobs, nonprofit jobs, and service industry or labor intensive jobs. For a lot of the past few years, my identity was wrapped up in working at a nonprofit because Given my previous work experience, I felt like working in a nonprofit was more of a moral profession that benefited society and was just, you know, better for the world. However, recently I really began to question whether working at a nonprofit really does any more to contribute to society than working at a for-profit company. And I've had to untangle how my journey in developing my professional identity and a sense of self had been influenced by what kind of work society deems important and prestigious. And I've also had to uncover and unpack the institutional forces that perpetuate the social narratives around purposeful work. So in this video, I'm going to be sharing how my views on work, especially social impact or social change work, have evolved after I realized the narcissistic tendencies and neoliberal ideology of the nonprofit industrial complex. If you follow my channel, you know that I am currently 
studying social work, currently meaning I'm going back to school in a few months. Before I got involved in that kind of work, I earned my bachelor's degree in operations management, which is basically this field of business that is about how products get manufactured and then transported to customers, supply chain, logistics, all that stuff. The field stems from Frederick Taylor's theory of scientific management, where basically the goal was to optimize production and make the workers work more efficiently. So I used to joke that I majored in capitalism because that's basically what it is. But this video is not about the ways that business schools neglect to provide students with alternative economic and social theories and thus maintain capitalist ideology. It's not about that. But as a side note and because of that, I used to be very insecure in talking about Marxist theory because I didn't have an academic background in social or economic theory. In fact, it was very much like shielded from me and I like wasn't allowed to learn about it. So I wanted to be clear to my audience, my viewers, anyone watching this video that learning about social theory through your own experiences, talking to people, watching videos, listening to podcasts, attending workshops, reading summarized or simplified texts is a really great way to learn about capitalism and political economy as long as you are applying critical thinking and self-reflection and thinking about your own actions in it. I'm totally not someone who is like, you have to read this book. In fact, I'm very much averse to people telling me what to read. But you should take everything with a grain of salt because not everything you read on the internet is the most evolved thought, I guess. Anyways, as a hyper-productive and career-oriented college student, I was very proactive in my postgraduate job search. So by the beginning of my senior year of college, I had already landed a job for after I graduated with a big four consulting firm where I would be making around $75,000 per year. So that's really good money for someone, at least in 2015 when I graduated. So for the majority of my time at that firm, which I worked at for about a year and a half, I was working on a project that in the grand scheme of things contributed to the military industrial complex. I really had no choice in this. It was either that or I was gonna get fired or something. I had totally this fear when I was working there that they would figure out that I was leftist and they would fire me and I was just like saving all this money for myself in case the worst thing happened because there's so many fear tactics that go into working in the federal government space about doing anything that was remotely critical of the government. Anyways, besides all of that, I was generally good at my job and the tasks associated with it, but it wasn't particularly challenging or stimulating. It was actually quite easy. And as I further developed my views on politics and society, I really began to question the ethics of the system I was being paid to participate in. And especially around this time, now it's 2016, and I was like, first of all, I don't want to be working for the military, and I do not want to be working for Trump's military. So I was like, I gotta get out of here. I mentioned that my job was easy. Basically, I was a glorified help desk ticket submitter. They were paying me $75,000 a year to submit help desk tickets. At my core, I believe that I was being overpaid because this job just shouldn't exist in a perfectly ethical world because we literally don't need the military like that. So in my internal calculations of things with personal fulfillment, the compensation, and the ethics of it all, it just wasn't worth it for me. Although some of the history and the theory behind operations management can be problematic, like many other things in life I don't believe can be dichotomized into good or bad and there are still parts of it that I really value. And I'm bringing up operations management a lot because as a field and as someone who was brought up in that sort of industry, many of its core tenants are still things that I personally value and is why I was interested in the field in the first place. Operations management emphasizes efficiency. And I think on the left, 
it can be easy to demonize efficiency and productivity like how many organizer meetings have i been in where we kind of scoff at being efficient or productive but I like to see it in a different way. On one hand, a company may want to increase efficiency in order to maximize their profits, get the most out of their workers while denying their humanity, etc, etc. But on the other hand, my personal idea of efficiency is just please don't waste my time and energy. Like, don't make me do things that I don't have to do. That all comes down to certain core beliefs or things that we hold to be true in society. And it's, it's a much more deeper philosophical question. I think especially for millennials brought up in the middle class like I was, a lot of us came into our early careers wanting to have a positive impact on society and fulfilling a greater purpose in our work. Where this comes from, I don't really know. But as a result, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to find a job with the right fit. So while many of my peers hop around jobs every few years, my mom, for example, had stayed at the same job that she started in her 20s for like over 20 years. And one day I was like, how? Why? <laughs> I want to quit my job like every day. And this pressure, wherever it comes from, can really affect our mental health as so much of our identities and egos can get wrapped up in what we do for a living. And so that's where I think healing is really important when it comes to thinking about work. I've heard of many people and have experienced for myself a great sense of loss when I've realized that a career path that I've dedicated so much time to pursuing just wasn't going to work out. So when I felt this sort of sense of loss at this big corporate capitalist organization that I was working at, for some reason my first thought was I should work at a nonprofit. And I ended up working there for over three years, which is the longest that I've ever been in a workplace. And I left about a year ago at the beginning of the pandemic, which you can watch the video about here. The idea of working at a nonprofit can be very appealing to the ego. Most likely, if you were to make a career shift like I did, working at a very prestigious, high paid industry, to working in nonprofits, you'll be making a lot less money, but you'll be doing fulfilling work and contributing to society in a positive way, or at least believing that you are. And I think it's really important to talk about like finances and be transparent in our finances. And now my cat's deciding he's going to eat. For the most part of my time working there, I was making about half what I was making in the consulting industry. That would be about $35,000 a year. For almost two years, I made that amount until I got a salary increase related to a promotion. Even though I was making a lot less, I was very proud of the fact that I was doing good work and I was working hard. I was working the hardest I had ever worked in my entire life and I was making a difference and I felt stimulated by the challenges that I had to overcome. And this period in my life was also marked by a lot of personal growth related to what I was learning on the job. And honestly, just working with young people was very transformational for me and healing for me as someone who had a lot to process about my own childhood. But back to the job itself, eventually it began to feel like I was the only one with the skills and experiences that was suited to do this job. And, you know, I believe that I had done a good and ethical thing by taking these skills, which I could have used for a capitalist for profit company and putting them into this nonprofit space where I was like, helping people and contributing to the community. Even when I felt like I wasn't being fairly compensated, I still felt like I couldn't leave the job because the program would fail without me. Because we were constantly struggling for resources and we had like bad infrastructure. And if I left, all information would leave with me and it would be a disservice to the community if I quit. The culture of the nonprofit world, at least in the type of work that 
that I was doing was based on resourcefulness and relationship building. So it really breeds this belief that each worker in the organization is necessary to keep the organization going and leaving the job would be like betraying the cause or community. So there was a period of time there where I was really contemplating leaving because I felt like this is all I can do here because it felt like this was all I can do here. I'm not making that much money. There's no room for growth. There's a lot of challenges that seem to not be able to be addressed adequately. So I was like thinking about changing things up when there was an opportunity for me to go after a promotion. That process was a messed up process for multiple reasons and something felt off about it in my heart honestly I didn't want it the organization had clearly been struggling with things for a while and I wasn't really sure if I wanted to be like in charge of those things and have to deal with them because there'd be a lot more responsibility in this new role but there are multiple factors in terms of what people were saying to me, what my supervisor had encouraged me to do, like just things that really prop you up and make you feel good. I truly believe that I was the best person to do this job and like fix these problems without really realizing that these problems were more than any one person, whether it was me or anyone else, someone who was more competent than me could ever fix because these challenges were greater than the organization itself. And that was my ego sort of believing that it was so important for me to take on this role because I had the skills equipped to address some of these problems and like I was the only one to do it and I was special for some reason in that way and ultimately it was for a good cause because there's no one else here that can do it no one else in the community that can fix these problems no one has my perspective on things and ultimately it was a good thing I got the promotion and what actually happened when I became a manager I was a program manager that I no longer did a lot of the community face work that made the previous role so fulfilling to me. I did a lot of things that were like really community involved. I was a volunteer recruiter. I would go into schools and talk to like families and talk to students. I didn't do that kind of stuff on a regular basis as a program manager and the majority of my time there I was bogged down in like administrative work and trying to navigate this nonprofit funding system, a system that is fundamentally flawed and oppressive. Oh, and then there was a pandemic. Today's nonprofit funding system, often referred to as the nonprofit industrial complex, stems from a trend of neoliberal economic policies that really took off during the Reagan era, which values free markets and privatization over government regulation. I know that at the end of my Oppressive Origins of Social Work video, I mentioned possibly making a video on Reagan era policies. So this little snippet of information might be it, but who knows, I might make another video eventually. While I'm not gonna go into depth about what neoliberalism is, I can tell you that it is neoliberalism that encourages social welfare, things like healthcare, transportation, environmental causes, and things like that be provided by private entities such as corporations and nonprofits rather than public tax funded government resources and then uh, as a side note like really working in the federal consulting industry really opened up my eyes to how much of what the government does is outsourced to businesses this type of neoliberal nonprofit system encourages a type of organizational narcissism where nonprofits are forced to compete for a limited pool of resources by proving through grant applications that they are the best organization to use and manage the funds for a specific social problem. And it also upholds this idea that without the funds for the program or organization, the community that the organization serves will inevitably suffer without them. It sort of just perpetuates this narrative. So folks who have worked in nonprofits are probably familiar with how organizations creatively use data and narrative on grant applications and reports to their advantage, regardless of the actual effectiveness or outcomes of their programs. So an area that I'm super interested in social work 
is program evaluation because literally it's the thing that every organization is the worst at. And so if you don't have that information, you can just kind of elaborate on whatever you have. I'm not saying that people are lying, but I'm questioning the validity and reliability of their data. There is actually little incentive for organizations to be honest and upfront about their shortcomings, because if you do, you're at risk at losing your funding. And this is just a macrocosm of how individuals are encouraged to be individualistic and look after themselves in the workplace by portraying themselves as indispensable to the organization. And this is to achieve recognition, compensation, just not get laid off. And it happens not only in nonprofits, but overall in the competitive culture of capitalism. The problem for me in this type of culture was that I hold transparency and honesty in high regard. I hope that it comes across in a lot of my videos. And it put me in an icky ethical position to overlook the ways in which I personally had doubts about what the organization was promising to execute to its funders. And I was the person in here right in the reports or right in parts of the grant application without having certainty that we actually knew what we were doing. And something that I hope to explore in the future, maybe in my studies in organizational leadership, is what a culture that values humility would look like and how that could actually strengthen organizations rather than create unsustainable messes. <laughs> It became emotionally and mentally exhausting for me to continuously violate my ethics and I started to feel like a waste of space again. I believe that members of the community are best suited to devising the solutions to their own problems and I felt like being a manager was being a barrier and gatekeeper to real community driven solutions. And so that feeling of being like a waste of space was very familiar to me and so I once again, optimize myself, operations management style, and I quit. Fast forward to a few months later when suddenly I was in a position where I was not working. You know, I had quit my job and at the time I was taking grad school classes online and I had to leave grad school because of a toxic internship experience. You can watch this video here if you're curious to know more about what happened there. And because I was taking a leave of absence, I would not be eligible for student loans. And I need to find a job that would be able to cover all of my living expenses. And the question of what social class I belong to also became relevant to me at this time. As I was recovering from several work-related traumas in nonprofits and in human services, and I had a lot of other things going on where I didn't have a lot of stability in my life, I wasn't really looking for a full-time job. So this put me in a position for looking at part-time temporary jobs. And for a lot of the things that I was applying to, the minimum requirement was a high school diploma. And it felt kind of ridiculous to me that I graduated six years ago and when I first started working, I was making $75,000 a year and now I was depending on jobs where I would be making less than $15 an hour. And I went into it thinking, you know, this is a temporary thing until I get back on my career path, essentially. And this video, to a large extent, is the result of me unpacking this idea that I had internalized that as someone who was raised in the middle class and had certain level of education and experience that I was above certain kinds of work that may be typically seen as working class and people who work in these jobs lack a greater purpose or motivation to succeed in life. And this is really like this concept of like bootstrapping especially because my parents were not born in the US. Even though that's the case, both of my parents went to college and so I'm not a first generation college student. And so it should be expected for me to go to college after both of my parents went to college and were able to have their own you know, versions of success. I think a lot of, especially being like an immigrant or first generation native born US citizen, 
I guess. Um, there's a lot of complexities in those identities, but that it would be not honoring the previous generation's sacrifices to come to America by just being a low life here and just like not working a good job. <laughs> but it got me thinking about why is it that certain jobs such as working in a nonprofit or working in like a social enterprise or even the government, why is it that those jobs are viewed as serving a greater purpose while others such as delivery drivers, construction workers, housekeepers, and grocery store clerks, thinking about myself, do not. For middle class folks who get wrapped up in working in low paid jobs in the nonprofit industry, we tend to forget that those kinds of jobs are also working class jobs, maybe because they do serve a greater purpose and are performed at a desk to some extent and we have this expectation that because you work in a nonprofit or because you're like a teacher or because you're a social worker that you know that you're gonna get paid less but it's compensated in the contribution you make in society but i think that's a misconception that those kinds of jobs aren't working class jobs because a lot of working class jobs in the u.s now are service related like nannies or like hotel hospitality Hospitality or telemarketers. <laughs> the concept of working class jobs is very much rooted in like this idea of like factory workers and because of neoliberalism a lot of that has changed in the US economy. After all, nonprofit workers have nothing but their labor to sell in order to make the money they need to survive and they don't own the means of production or service. At least I think that's what Marx would say. So with all that being said, in the end, I started working at a grocery store and was surprised to find myself very fulfilled doing a very simple job. I work around 30 hours a week. I do have to have obscene hours like going to work at either 6 a.m. and starting this week because I'm cross training in a different department, working until like 11 p.m. But outside of those hours, I don't have to take my work home with me and I get to do whatever I want with the 10 extra hours I have. Compared to my job as a nonprofit manager, I actually feel like I'm contributing to society. And I think a lot of what got me thinking about this was, you know, this idea of essential workers and essential jobs. So then there is this contradiction that I had kind of exposed for myself that some of the jobs that are heralded as the most purposeful, the ones where the people in these roles are tasked with devising the solutions to some of the most challenging social problems where you have control over like a lot of money to make decisions based off of that and things like that are actually the ones that lack a greater purpose as they fail to directly impact the material and psychological conditions of the people. So while I was like a nonprofit manager, a lot of what I had to do was sort of theoretically thinking about if our program is designed this way, how would it benefit the participants in it? And then I would have to fill out paperwork that would sort of prove that and apply for money. And then I have all this money and then I would be able to use it to spend the money on things that would be a part of a program, but not like give the money directly to the people. If the problem is that these youth are low income, why don't we just like give them money, you know, like, wouldn't that be the direct solution? But when I work my job at the grocery store, I know that I have a direct impact on providing people with the food that they need not only to survive, but also for their pleasure and enjoyment. Food is literally something that everyone needs, and I believe that pleasure in life should not be a luxury. And yes, they can plug in another worker for me, and that worker will do just as decent a job as me. But being replaceable is exactly what has shifted for me. During the internship, that was supposed to be critical for me in setting up my social work career. I was gaslit so hard that everything that I believed that I was good at and all the skills that I had and my like personality traits that made me suitable for social work and was why I pursued this field. All of that stuff that I believed about myself was like squeezed out of me and 
I was like literally a shell of a person. And it kind of took like hitting this like rock bottom of like me believing that I was special and I had really had something to contribute to this field. I don't want to like make it sound like a good thing, but it took seeing things from that other perspective that was just like, I'm a basic human and all I need are the basic needs in life and I don't need to fulfill a greater purpose because each person on this planet does have something to contribute and just by merely living they are fulfilling their purpose and so after I had that experience I really struggled with the idea of returning to the program to finish my degree that's why I had to withdraw from it and I almost gave up on this idea of my dream job my dream job was to become a therapist and open my own practice and start my own organization and do all these things and I kind of have given up on that dream job. I am still pursuing that path. I'm going to be going back to school to finish my degree. But honestly, if it didn't work out for me, I would have been satisfied just working in a service job for the rest of my life because I know that as long as my basic needs are met, then I'm good to go. I don't need anything else. I don't need to fulfill a greater purpose in society. I no longer feel this immense pressure of the ego that I am the one to fix the world's problems and just fulfilling my purpose means just being true and authentic to myself among the masses or who Martin Luther King may refer to as the beloved community and I'm currently reading a book that I've mentioned before and I'm such a slow reader that sort of expands on the idea of the beloved community being just everyone in the world no matter what life experience they come from. Of course I do not mean to romanticize service or labor intensive jobs. I'm lucky to have found an employer that for the most part treats their workers well, although there are definitely ways that they could treat them better and a lot of it comes down to certain individuals who just could approach their management better. As a young adult with no children and an extremely simple life, I can make $15 an hour go pretty far. And yes, I did get a raise recently, so I am actually making $15 an hour now. But I can't imagine having this kind of job while trying to raise a family or taking care of aging parents or having like chronic health issues or things like that. Not everyone in these types of jobs has the experience or life circumstances that I have and we need to be fighting for better working conditions for all workers. However, we should not wait around for the CEO of a company to change your corporate policies or for the government to enforce new regulations such as the $15 minimum wage. The only reason why I got one was because the state is changing it so the company had to increase their wages or for a nonprofit to come in and save the day when workers are being exploited and don't have the services they need like how ironic would it be that someone who works in a grocery store has to get food at a food bank that the grocery store donates to Does that make any sense I truly believe that in order for our social problems to be addressed and fixed, it won't be because of individuals like individual brilliant CEOs, nonprofit executives, policymakers, politicians, or even nonprofit program developers, a career path that I'm sort of projected to follow, I guess, if I finish my degree. It will be because regular everyday people have figured out a way to reclaim their humanity and fulfill those needs for themselves. And in order for me to be a part of that process, I must let go of that part of me that believes that I'm special enough to have the solution to the world's problems. And that part of me was very active when I was working at a nonprofit. I remember coming back from work after my first few days and telling my partner like, I don't know how to interact with regular people. And by regular people, I think I met like people who are not involved in like social justice organizing or doing like social justice work in nonprofits. And I'm just totally not good at small talk generally. So that was just really difficult for me. But the more small talk 
I engaged in, the more I realized how much everyone has had horrible jobs and bosses and challenging life experiences and how they themselves had great ideas and visions on how to make their jobs and lives easier and better for them. I don't know why, but sometimes the first thing that I talk to with a new person from work that I hadn't talked to before is like, what was your job before and did it suck? I had to challenge this idea that there is a difference between an organizer or you know a social justice leader and an everyday person because i think when we we as in people who have taken on certain leadership roles in social movements take on certain identities and labels we can sometimes lose the wholeness and complexity of being human. I'm also human, like I'm also part of the working class. I'm also a worker. I'm not just an organizer or leader or whatever. And at the end of the day, all I just wanna be is human and free. Capitalism is entrenched in everything that we do. Whether you work for a company, at a nonprofit, or even the government, it's all still capitalism. But the answer to our problems with capitalism is not as simple as quitting your job. At the end of the day, you have to do what feels good to you and your life circumstances. And for each person, it's gonna be different. There is no shame in having to work. And let's just like get rid of this idea that you individually uphold capitalism by continuing to participate in it. However, we will need to raise a collective consciousness of our conditions in order to change them. So as I love to do at the end of these videos, I will leave some questions for your own little thought experiments because of course I'm not claiming to know all the answers and we need everyone to be contributing to this conversation. So the questions are, what makes work compulsory? How does what we are paid to do influence our sense of self? And where do these ideas come from? What kinds of work are valued either by prestige, compensation, or moral standards? And are they actually necessary? And what is the role in nonprofits in social transformation? And in what ways do nonprofits actively prevent social transformation? I'd love to read your reflections in the comments and would love to know if you have a different perspective on anything I brought up in the video. My reflection on the value of work and narcissism in the nonprofit industrial complex is largely based on my personal experience and relationship to work. Of course, over time my thoughts may change, but this is where I am now. I've enjoyed preparing this video for you all, so if you enjoyed watching it, I'd love for you to give this video a thumbs up. That really helps me with algorithm as well as giving me a comment. And please subscribe. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!